All right. Praise the Lord. My goodness. That was good. I, 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 you know, we thought we might have to uh, do some of our video stuff today, right? Mm. Thank the Lord for that, by the way, and y'all all know I do. I praise the Lord that we can uh, <clears throat> take, our, take care of our own band when they're, when they're full force and kicking and all of that kind of stuff. <laughs> Woo! So quick, too, brother. <laughs> that was a ninja that came up by me, wasn't it? I, now, that's the difference between being old and being young. Because I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there going, I'm looking like that, and I'm watching that mic roll toward the edge. Of that, and I'm just standing here like this, watching it roll like that right there, thinking, somebody ought to get that. <laughs> and all of a sudden, a ninja flashed by me. <laughs> he caught it out of the air down here. <laughs> you know, like, go, oh, my Lord. Man, I love that. Shoot, boy. But anyway, man, I tell you what. I don't know where I don't know where you guys are in um, in, in listening. Is what I'm about, what I'm babbling about up here, in listening to uh, the series that we've been in while you guys have been gone and we've been out on COVID and all that other kind of stuff. You know, I was in a series called The Hurt Locker, and I had just preached one message, and I, I really that mess that that series I think is really going to be great for us. Um, I, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I feel uh, convicted a lot of times when I say things like that because I'm thinking, well, f what everything God says is good for us. <laughs> you know, it's like somebody asked me what my favorite book of the Bible in uh, is, and I said, well, wh whichever one we're in that that particular time. I love all of them, and so anyway, there's nothing God could say to you that wouldn't be great for your lives. But you guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, certain series, uh, you, you feel like you have some responsibility with, uh, with, with it. And so I started substituting this that I'm in today while, um, while everybody was out and, you know, and we were doing video stuff and all of that. And, and it was a series about King David, life, about King David's life. And you know that David was the greatest king to, of Israel's history, still considered the greatest king that Israel ever had. And, and he ruled, just to give you an idea, back around 1000 BC, roughly right back in there, 970. Uh, so that's been uh, 3000 years ago. Uh, that's a long time to be considered great, right? I mean, you'd have figured somebody would come along <laughs> sooner or later and, uh, and, and, and beat that, but, but they haven't. And so what we're doing is we're learning lessons in greatness from the greatest king that Israel ever had. That's pretty much what it boils down, King David. And we've been through seven of them so far. And in your notes and on the screen and on your screen will pop up the, the seven things that we've learned and the eighth one today that we've learned. Great things, these are things that make great people. And just, I feel obligated to say this every time. When I'm talking about being a great person, I'm not talking about the, the way the world figures greatness, to be rich or to be popular, to be uh, successful or talented, whatever, whatever they might, whatever the world might call greatness. I'm not talking about being great like that. I'm talking about what God considers greatness. And God considers greatness in accomplishing the purpose that he put us here for. We've been placed here to go throughout every stretch of a society and, and, and nation and, and show the ways of God and speak the ways of God and try to lead people in faith to trust God so their lives can be affected by the one that loves them most, the one that created them, and the one that is our master and our Lord. So we have a really big, big job. So God births us. God, God forms great people in the wombs of their mothers and then places them here on this earth. And to become great, there are 10 things that I've identified out of David's life, and I'm sure you could probably find some more, but at least these 10 things. If you're gonna be a great person, if you're gonna accomplish what God put you here for, if you're gonna be that man or woman of God that God had in mind when you were in your mother's womb, then these 10 things are gonna be true about your life. And we've looked at them, let's see, great people become great on the battlefield. Yeah, you can't become great sitting at the house or hanging out at the club or whatever it might be. You get great on the battlefield. Uh, second thing, because all of us make mistakes, 
We're all human, we do make mistakes. Great people take responsibilities for their mistakes. They don't try to pass them on and it's his fault and her fault and all. And, and, uh, and they not only take responsibility for the mistakes they've made, they actually grow from those mistakes. They, they learn lessons from those. How many of you have learned lessons from some mistakes you've made? Uh, yeah, okay, I, me too. I've learned a lot of lessons. And, and my goal, you know what my goal for the rest of my life is? Don't make those mistakes. That, that's, that's my goal. Don't learn things the hard way. God gave us a whole Bible filled with his words about how to be successful in life, and, and yet we still somehow manage to learn the hard way on many things. The third lesson was uh, great people rise above the pain of their past. All of us have pain. In order to be great, you have to deal with that pain, and that comes in lots of ways, and, and I shared a message about that. And then number four was great people pay the price to be a worshiper. They, great people worship the Lord, and they pay a price to do so. It costs something to worship the Lord. Now, it may not be uh, money or uh, uh, sometimes it's not even time. I mean, you, they're, they're just things... Uh, your, your, your attitudes being right, your, uh, your spirit being in touch with, with the Lord, uh, uh, the word of God being active in your life. I mean, th these are all things that are necessary for worship and praise to take place in your life. Much less somebody might actually call you a holy roller or a fanatic or something. I mean, you know, you may face some sh some social uh, issues out of that. I mean, all kinds of prices we pay to be a worshiper. But great people worship the Lord, not only at church, but everywhere else. Uh, number five was great people think in a positive, God-focused manner regardless of the circumstances. We think by faith uh, in every circumstance or in, in all circumstances. When David looked at the giant, he didn't see a giant. He looked at an uncircumcised Philistine. <laughs> you know, God, I'm, un, I'm in the covenant because I'm circumcised. He's not circumcised. He's not in the covenant. That means I'm protected and he's not. Who's, what, what's, what about this crazy uncircumcised Philistine? You know why David said that? Because he was looking through God attitude and not his own. That's what great people do. Then number six was great people submit to God's authority and to those he delegates. God has authority, he's our ultimate authority, but he does delegate his authority to people here on the earth. And Romans 13, and if you want to read something that is just straightforward and you don't even need a preacher to interpret it, read Romans 13. Romans 13 will tell you your responsibilities to the people that God has placed into authority to submit and obey and be responsible to these people, whether you like them or not unless they're telling you to do something unscriptural or illegal or immoral, you are to obey those that have the rule over you. <clears throat> Pay your taxes. It's, I mean, it, it says everything. It, it has it down. It says that the IRS, God created the IRS to be a minister to us. How about that? Amen? <laughs> We, <laughs> I can't, I'm sorry, IRS, I can't even get a crunt out of them. But, but they're our ministers and we're to obey. All right, then number seven, the last week, was great people admit weaknesses and become accountable to others. In other words, you, you have some areas of your life. David was so strong in many areas, it's unbelievable. He was so great in many areas, it was outstanding. But there were some areas of his life that he was pitiful in. And the same is true with all of us. Look, look, nobody has the complete package. That's just all there is to it. Nobody has everything. If, if you did, you wouldn't need Jesus and you wouldn't need us. And God created us with certain flaws and failures for two reasons. One, so we would need him. And second, so we would need each other. And then he said, now find you somebody that's strong in the area that you're weak in and let them keep you accountable and you keep them accountable because they got a weak area too and, and, and come together as a body and, and, and don't make the same mistakes and don't do crazy things. And, and so that's the seventh. Now the eighth falls right into that. And, and it's, it's a crazy little thing that happened about 10 years before David died. Right at the end of his reign, lots of things had been settled, but some crazy little thing comes in, and we'll, we'll read it in just a second. But it creates this eighth truth about greatness, and, and it is 
great people humbly depend upon God and give him the praise and glory that he deserves. Now, this is about pride. Now, I know you, you may look at that truth and you may say, that's about pride. <laughs> well, if I'm humble, <laughs> then I'm submitted and submissive. It means, it means I look at myself in the right light. What's the opposite of humble? To be proud. So I can either approach God humbly or I can approach with pride. And if I give God the praise and the glory that he deserves, then I won't be trying to steal his glory and his praise for myself, which is basically what pride is. And at the end of his life, David had settled things like the, the deal with Bathsheba and Uriah had been settled. David had gotten him some counselors and, and some great people in his life that, that helped him be submissive and helped him be transparent and helped him be accountable for all of his stuff and give him wise counsel and help him know what to do and what not to do. And those things were great in his life. And, 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 and what happens now, <laughs> what happens now is so, is so s subtle and tragic, seriously. That when I read these passages and you hear this, what he did, you're going to be, you'll be thinking, well, my goodness, that, that's not really all that bad, is it? Really? I mean, could, what in the world's the deal with this? But it just wreaks havoc, guys. It, it, it's, it's something. It's found in First Chronicles chapter 21. It'll be on your screen up here. And I'm just going to read it and just kind of let you see what happened. It's, it's huh. My goodness, who would have thought this would stir up so much trouble? Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. But he's talking about a census. He's talking about just count people. All right, that doesn't sound bad, right? I mean, the United States has a census this year. We count them every 10 years. Most nations of the world have census all the time. So here's David saying, Okay, I want to count all my people. But he's really not counting all his people. Back in those days, they just counted the soldiers, just people that were a fighting age. It was a way to, to see how strong your military was, is really what it was. I mean, how many, how many men do I have that can fight for our country? All right, that's the issue. Verse two, so David said to Joab, that's his leader general, and to the leaders of the people, go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab pushes back. His great general, counselor, a friend, accountability partner, <laughs> all that, pushes back now. And answered, may the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my Lord, the king, are, they, are, are not they all my Lord's servants? In other words, don't, don't all the people serve you regardless of how many it is? Well, we got to know how many. Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why should he be the cause of guilt in Israel? You, do you get the idea that Joab thinks this is not a good idea? Joab's like looking at him and said, now, David, you might want to reconsider this. This is not, this, this is going to make God hot now. I'm going to tell you, God's not going to like this and it's going to be bad. So you, are you sure you might, you better reconsider? And this is the only time David doesn't pay attention to Joab right here. And look, what, and you'll see what happens. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. It always will. Therefore, Joab departed and he went throughout all Israel and he came to Jerusalem. Then Joab gave the sum of the number of people to David. All Israel had 1,100,000 men who drew the sword and Judah had 470,000 men who drew the sword. But he did not count Levi and Benjamin among them for the king's word was abominable to Joab. <laughs> Joab, he, it was unethical to him. Or he just said, this is wrong. God's gonna kill somebody over this. And he didn't want it to be Levi because they were the priests and he didn't want it to be the tribe of Benjamin because they had already been killed and torn up by, by the Lord earlier. They almost didn't have enough people to, for the Lord to even get any more of them. So he, he, he tried to keep them out of it and, and he, he just, it's, it's bad. All right, verse seven, and God was displeased with this thing. 
<laughs> Imagine that. And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he struck Israel. So David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I've done this thing. But now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Then the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, which is David's prophet. David had a prophet assigned to him. His pastor was Nathan the prophet, but he was for the area. This guy was his own personal um, communicator with God and so forth. And anyway, he, the name was Gad. He, he comes to David and, he said, and, uh, and the Lord said, all right, go say this to David. Go and tell David, saying, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself that I may do it to you. That doesn't sound good, does it? <laughs> so Gad came to David and he said to him, thus says the Lord, choose for yourself either three years of famine or three months to be defeated by your foes with the sword of your enemies overtaking you, or else three days the sword of the Lord, the plague in the land with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now consider what answer I should take back to him who sent me. Whew. So I got, I got three years of famine. I got three days, three weeks of my enemy uh, beating me with a sword and tearing me up and all of that are three days of God sending a plague and the angel coming down and destroying a bunch of stuff. So God says, take which one you want. And David said to Gad, I'm in great distress. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord. For his mercies are very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. In other words, whatever you do, I want God to, make, to be my judge because God might have some mercy on me. You know, God might have, God, after a while, God might quit beating on me. You know, he might say, that's enough. But these, these men, I know what they'll do. And I, please keep me out of the hands of men. And, um, and <laughs> let's see. And so the Lord sent a plague upon Israel and 70,000 men of Israel fell. 70,000 men died in the plague and God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it, the, the city, the capital city. As he went, he was destroying, as he went and was destroying, the Lord looked and relented of the disaster and said to the angel who was destroying, it is enough, now restrain your hand. So David was right. God was gracious to him and merciful, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. After 70,000 people died. Yeah. And, and some of the city was torn up because the angel had already started before he stopped him. So I don't know what he got, but somebody's sheds got tore up or something. I don't know what it was. Stop, restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. We're going to have some about that in the next couple of messages. Ornan deal. It, it, it's something too. So my goodness, uh, is this overreacting? Is God overreacting here? Uh, it's, this is almost as bad as when God uh, wouldn't let Moses go into the promised land because God said, speak to the rock and it'll give you water. And he hit the rock, right? I mean, he, that's all he did. He just said, you speak to it. And, 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 Mo, and Moses said, well, that dead gum rock, give me some water. And God said, all right, boy. That's it for you. I, that is it. That's it. You will not. The people are going in the land that I promised them, but you're not. You're not going in the land. You got it, man. What's wrong with you? You know. So does God overreact? I mean, is there a reason? What in the world has happened here? Well, all right, let me give you a little perspective, all right? So as to why God might be acting like this. First of all, God founded Israel, not men. The, Israel was not founded for some geopolitical reason or for some travel or trade route. Or, Israel was established by God himself when God made a covenant with Abraham. And they started as a nation. And for all of the years, by the way, which was about a thousand, if you're interested, for about a thousand years between 
God making the covenant with Abraham and the first king, Saul, being established in Israel about a thousand years. For all of those years, read the book of Judges, you'll see all that. For a thousand years, guess who was king of Israel? God himself. God was king of Israel. And then the people started begging, we want a king like everybody else. God said, I'm your king. Well, man, we want one like all the people. Well, I thought I was doing a good job. I mean, uh, you, all right, I'm going to give you one because you're stubborn. I'm going to give you one, but I'm going to tell you something. He's going to be a disappointment to you, and he's, you're not going to like it, and he's going to mess you up. But I'm giving you what you want because you keep on asking for it. I got to teach you a lesson. And so here, there's Saul. Saul gets to be the first king of Israel, human king. Saul starts doing bad. I mean, he starts, the words that God said to the people start coming true. And Saul gets so nasty and so um, uh, disobedient that God says to Samuel, the prophet, uh, go down to Jesse's house and, there's a, and, and get one of his boys named David, get him and, and anoint him to be the future king of Israel. So the point is that Israel belongs to God. It, it, the people didn't vote David in. God placed David in. Therefore, David was not the people's representative. David was God's representative. And he was God's king over all of Israel. And now David comes along with this census stuff numbering his soldiers and all the fighting men of Israel, let me just ask you a question. What would be the motive for me to go throughout my whole nation and number all the men I have in my nation that, that are old enough, big enough, strong enough, and not too old to carry a sword and fight in a battle? What, wh why would I want to do that when every battle that I've ever been in in my entire life God has been the one who won the victory. What would it matter if I had 10 or 500 if God was the one that always won the victory for me? It didn't seem to matter when he was a little boy standing up there saying, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? It didn't seem to matter to it when he was running toward that uncircumcised Philistine said, said, battles are not won with many or few, but the battle is the Lord's. In other words, saying to, saying to Goliath, it doesn't matter that you're a big old fighting machine and I'm a little old boy because battles belong to the Lord. He's the one that wins the victory. But now it seems David has another attitude about this thing. God has always blessed David. God blessed him with men to fight. God blessed him with a nation to have. God blessed him with homes and families and children and trucks and crops, riches and possessions and made him the greatest king in all the world. And now the greatest king in all the world looks around his kingdom and says, well, how great am I? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. How, well, how great am I? Well, how, how can we find out? Well, go out there and just number all these fighting men and then when you go to the next king's convention, you can brag up on the, you know, uh, to the other kings about how big and strong and powerful and mighty you are. Of course, that was what was being whispered in David's ear. You are something else, buddy. Hey, you're attractive. You're, you have the prettiest wives and concubines in this whole land. Nobody can win a battle against you. You are the meanest fighting machine that's ever been created. You have the world by the tail on a downhill pull. You, man, they, they need to be having some parades for you. You are wonderful. You're the greatest leader that's ever existed. And David said, oh, you know, you might be right. But it came as a whisper. <laughs> so it's hard, to, it's hard to, to believe that it could be the enemy. It's not the big, powerful, I'm tempting you in such a fashion. Because if he did, we'd all resist that. We'd say, I see you, you big ear, long tailed creature. Get away from me, Satan. It's the whisper <laughs> on your shoulder, soft voice. You know, you've seen them on the cartoons, right? They might not be very far off of that. <laughs> and 
And he, and he, and he, and he convinces David to, to, to number his men so that David can show how great he is. How it's not about God anymore. It's about him. How powerful. God's not getting the praise anymore. God's not getting the glory anymore. I'm going to get the glory because after all, I'm the king and I've done all of these things and it's not about God. It's all about me. The question that a great person must always ask is, I want you to listen to this. How much can God bless me before I begin to think that it's all about me? How much can God bless me before I begin to think it's all about me? That's the question of pride. That's the question of the census that David takes. <laughs> God had blessed him with everything. God had given him everything and now he's taking everything that God gave him and he's using it against God. Imagine that. All of the blessings, all of the opportunities, all of the people, all the riches, all of that had been given to him by God and now he's taking the very thing that God gave him and he's, and, and he's now begun to worship it rather than God. Now it's getting the praise and glory and God's not. Isn't that ironic? How much would God have to bless you? Can God bless you? Can God bless you and you not turn it around and use it against him? See, that's why it was so severe. That's what happened to David. That's what happened to Moses. The same exact motive. Same exact thing. Now, we're going to look at, look at this with three questions, uh, if I can get through them and all of that kind of stuff. But let's see. All right, question number one. We're going to use three questions to get through all of this uh, event. Question number one. What went wrong? <laughs> all right. Uh, well, what went wrong was that um, the Scripture tells us that, that, that God... Um, that God has a protection over our life when we get saved. How many of you ever, have ever heard um, that God has sent his angel to guard over the heirs of salvation? All right, who are the heirs of salvation? We are. You've been saved, you got Jesus in your heart, you're, you're a Christian, then you have, you've heard of a guardian angel, right? Well, you have one. And God protects you, God puts his hand over you. God insulates you. Satan just can't do what he wants to. He, 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 he just, he, he's limited. He, he, can't, he can't penetrate some things because God's blessing is over your life. All right. So for, for Satan to be able to do what he wants to do, he has to get you out from under God's, or, or God's covering, God's protection. So what happened here in Israel? Well, it's all in the, in the first verse of what happened here. In 1 Chronicles 21, 1, the first verse says, Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So for Samuel said, I mean, yeah, uh, Chronicles says that Satan whispered in David's ear and told David, take a numbering. All right, now, if you go to 2 Samuel chapter 24, you'll have the same story as we read in, first, in Chronicles here. And the first verse says, And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he, meaning God, moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. Now one one book clearly says that Satan stood up and did it. The other book says that God did it. So which one is right? Right. Both are right. That's right. Both of them are right. The only way the devil could stand up against Israel was if God took his protecting cover off of them. 
And the only reason God would take his protective covering off of them is because of their disobedience. When Israel disobeyed God, God removed and became proud and arrogant. Look, do you think God can read somebody's heart? Do you think that God can read somebody's motive? Do you think that God can see things in you that you can't see in yourself? And when God began to see the haughtiness and the arrogance and the cockiness and the pride in, in the king of Israel, King David, his man that he anointed and put there, God said, all right, buddy, we're gonna, I, I'm going to let you see how great you are. And he began to move his covering back off of David. And when he moved his covering off of David, Satan stood up like a, like a lion. You know, lions, they crawling. Looking, looking. I'm, have any of you ever watched any nature stories or been on a safari or anything? Well, I, I've never been on a safari, but I've watched these nature stories. And, and, he, and here's what the lion, here's what the lion does. Lion just, he, when he's hunting, and it's mostly the females. And when they're hunting, they get out on their belly. They get out on their belly and they slide along the ground. Slow, slow. They make it barely breathing. Looking, looking, looking. And they're down here low, enemies, I mean, the meat's up there, boy. And then they just get right there. And then as soon as they get their advantage, they jump and they stand up and then go down on their enemy. That's what Satan did. He stood up against Israel because God had removed his covering because Israel had gotten cocky and arrogant and proud. And God said, let me show you something, boys. This ain't going to work. <laughs> and the fact, there are two principles at work, and fill in your blank wherever you'd like to fill it in, but there are two principles at work. One is God hates pride. Did you know this? See, everybody thinks pride is just really nothing. Oh, a little pride. I mean, come on, my goodness, man. What? Treat it so casually. They say, if pride... Doesn't really matter, you know? But according to Proverbs chapter 6, what does it say? Six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. And the, a proud, and the first one is a proud look. Lying hands. Feet that shed innocent blood. <laughs> and it goes on. But the first one that God says are an abomination to him is a proud look. And you have done it, and I have done it, and we have all done it. You know, that look, those haughty eyes, right? That's what proud look means, by the way, haughty eyes. Those haughty eyes that look, and that little light smirk on your face, it says, I did it. Yeah, I did it. <laughs> yeah, I got you. You can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't do it like me. Yeah, I've had lots of practice at this. Haughty eyes. God says, I hate. He didn't, now, he didn't say he hated you, and he didn't say he hated you even if you're prideful. He says, I hate pride. That's what I hate. You know why? Because he knows what pride's going to do to you. You know what pride's going to do to you? Pride is going to destroy your life and separate you from him. Now, I'm not saying that you can't be a Christian and have pride. Don't get me wrong. If you're sitting here and you're prideful as can be and you've turned your heart over to the Lord and you've given your life to Jesus, you're a Christian. You're just full of pride. And what that pride is doing is destroying your life because you're not as close to God as you could be. You know, because God wants to bless you. Listen, you know what? God, you came out of your mother's womb with greatness on you. And God needs you to be great. And the only way you're going to be great is if he is able to bless you. You're never going to be great on your own. God is going to have to bless you if you're going to be great. But if you foot pumped up and puffed up and arrogant with pride, God can't bless you. Therefore, you can't become what God designs you to be. And God knows that. So why does God hate pride? Because of what it does to you. Pride will cause you to reject him even, you know. 
I mean, my goodness, destroy you and reject you. And God says, this is an abomination. Pride always causes rebellion. Pride is the seedbed of rebellion in our life. And God not only hates pride, he actively fights against pride. What does James chapter four say? James chapter four says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. What does resist mean? Resist is a military word. Resist means a, 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 a force of opposition, like a battalion, like a giant, like a big force, a big force of opposition against the enemy. So when this verse says, this verse says, God not only hates pride, but God gets in a battle with pride. And when God gets into battle, God doesn't send one little lonely troop, although one angel could handle the problem, seriously. But God sends a whole battalion in. In other words, God hates pride so much that he's willing to use overwhelming force to be able to keep pride out and to fight and to war against pride. You know, the Bible, Paul, the Apostle Paul talked about fighting the fight and winning the victory. You guys remember that? He said, fight the good fight. I have fought a good fight. I've kept the face. I've finished my course. He said, there's a good fight. There's also a bad fight. The bad fight is, the good fight's with the devil. You can whip him. The bad fight is with God. You ain't gonna win that. And so God resisted. And then the next verse is following James 4, 6. Look at what it says. Submit to God. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You got you to submit to God first. What does submit mean? Humble yourself. Bow yourself. Give it to God. Submit to God. Resist the devil. Then he'll flee from you. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. You know why? Because you're never as close as you think you are. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, because your hands get dirty every day. You got to wash them a bunch of times. And, 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 and you know, you don't want to sin with your hands and be art in your heart. And you don't want to sin your heart and be bad with your hands. So you cleanse your hands and you purify your heart. Lament and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. That's what happens when you see yourself as you really are. That haughty eyes, smirky smile junk turns to gloom and despair when you see as you really are. You say, have you ever asked God, let me see you from your eyes? Don't do it. Because if he answers that prayer, it's going to depress you beyond <laughs> imagination. Let me see you as you see <laughs> <laughs> no, God, don't ever let me see that. I don't want to ever see that. And then that last little verse, what does it say? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. You humble yourself. People pray, God, humble me. God, humble me. God, go, God, I'm so prideful. Humble me, God. You better quit praying that. Because God just told you he doesn't humble anybody. He said, you humble yourself. Now let me tell you what God will do. He'll humiliate you. Uh, yeah, yeah. You keep on praying that God humble me stuff and you don't humble yourself. And you know what's going to happen before long? You're going to be somewhere sometime and something. Have you had, ever had that dream where a bunch of people sitting out there and they're all laughing at you and you don't know what's happening? You look down, you see your drawers, that's it. You forgot to put your pants on or something like that. Have you ever found that? You were humiliated. Humiliated. And when you get humiliated and you say, oh God, I just, oh, I'm pitiful, God. I'm... Yeah, then you humble yourself. He humiliates you, then you humble yourself. So you can do it the hard way, uh, the hard way or the easy way. All right, so anyway. God hates pride, and then God loves humility. He says, if you'll humble yourself, I'll give grace to you, which means I'll give you everything you need, and so forth. All right, so the first principle is God hates pride. The second principle is pride is Satan's open door into our life. I'm gonna read that passage of scripture that I was illustrating just a moment ago about the line, and just think about what I was saying about how they work and all of that. Satan works just like them, and I'm gonna prove it to you. In 1 Peter 5, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. You younger people, submit yourself to your elders. That's what's wrong. You young people need to submit. Well, well wait a minute. Yes, all of, okay. All, all, 
All of you be submissive to one another. Submission to authority keeps us humble, right? Hey, listen, if, if, if submission to authority does nothing else in our life, it will keep us humble. If I have to obey, it's going to keep me humble in a way. So he says, all right, let's just go ahead and start practicing it. You young people, be submissive to those old people. And everybody be submissive to one another. And look at this next line. And be clothed with humility. We have to make a choice to put on humility. To be clothed means I'm not born with it, right? I, I don't wake up out of bed and have it on automatically. I got a clothes, like I go over to my closet and I choose what clothes I'm gonna put on that day. I look in there and I see humility and I take humility out and I put on humility. I clothe myself with humility because it's a choice that I have to make. I have to choose to do this because we're not naturally born humble. We are born prideful and with a rebellious spirit. We are men, we are fallen men. We need a savior, we're sinners. We're not born humble, we're born prideful. We're born rebellious in our life. We're born self-reliant in our life. That's why we have to choose to put on these things that are good for us. All right, submit, be clothed with humility. For, and here's the verse from James again, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. That's the second time God said it in the New Testament right there. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your care on him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. May means you have to get, he's asking permission, right? If he, if he, if he could just do it without asking, he'd just, it would say, uh, seeking whom he can devour. Can means am I able to do it? May means do I have permission to do this? God never misses a trick. I'm telling you, the word of God is amazing. Satan cannot get to you unless he gets permission to. God can't, may I chomp on them a little bit? God, do I have your permission to devour part of them? Because I'm ready. So can I do it? Because if he can do it, God's going to have to remove his covering off of you. Or he can't even do that. So pride has a double curse. It's like a two-edged sword. One side of the blade is God withdraws from you and, 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 uh, and then not only withdraws but opposes you at the same time. Boy, this is, that would be a mess. All right, the double-edged sword, one side is God moves back from me. Now, it doesn't mean you're not saved anymore. It just means you're in trouble. And God pulls his covering back and then he also starts resisting you at the same time. And then the other side of the sword is the devil gets to do what he wants to to you. That's what pride will do for you. Pride is a double-edged sword. Humility is also a double-edged sword, right? But it's not a double-edged sword of, uh, of opposition. It's not a double-edged sword of curse. It's a, it's, a, it's a blessing to your life. God protects and God blesses you. What, what did that verse 6 said? He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Uh, 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 bow yourself in the mighty presence of God so that he might what? Lift you up. So when you are... When you're humble, God says, humility is what I, I love. I hate pride, but I love humility. And if you're humble, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not, I'm going to bless you, whatever grace you need, uh, saving grace, financial grace, living grace, um, uh, job grace, or work grace, school grace, whatever grace you need, I'm going to bless you with that grace. And I am going to keep my protection over you, my insulation over you so that Satan can't rise up against you. 
And the other side of that blessing sword is there's no way Satan can bother you. Now, he'll, he'll still whisper, but he can't chomp you because God doesn't let him do that. Humility slams the door for Satan's chomping in our life. All right, first question, what went wrong? Second question, how much can God bless you and you not use it against him? I need, Tanya, do I need to stop? Do I need to stop, y'all? Well, I'm just wondering because, I mean... All right, here we go. I only, got, I only got just a little tiny bit. All right, how much can God bless you? The first question was, all right, what went wrong? That's what went wrong. That's what happened. David fell for all of that that I just talked about. That's what went wrong. Now, the second question would be, how much can God bless you and you won't use it against him? Because many people do use God's blessing against him, right? David did. David did. Every man, God, every man in the kingdom, that's what Joab tried to tell him, right? Joab said, hey, David, why do we need to number our fighters? Because isn't every man in the kingdom already subject to you? You're the king. They'll do what you ask them to do. We don't need to number them and find out. Why do we need to know how many of them there are? They're, they're all. I mean, when you say, how many men do we have? All of them. <laughs> that's right. And, 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 and everything he had in his kingdom was, was given by God. And David was a shepherd who knew nothing about kinging and, and being a king and, and being with that three-fourth crowd. And God took him out of the sheepfold and made him a great king. And then he used that against God. Now he wakes up one day and he decides, you know, uh, the God who blessed him and made him great... Um, that's a wonderful thing to have, but, but, but he becomes arrogant with God's blessing and he replaces God with the blessing that God had given him. Attractive people do this sometimes, right? You're born beautiful. You're beautiful. Your beauty and your charm opens doors for you. It allows you to earn lots of money and have lots of influence in life. For people to be nice to you and gracious. For people to want to be around you because of your beauty. And when you draw them around you because of your beauty, you corrupt them, you harm them. You lead them in evil, disastrous things and thoughts in their life. Who made you beautiful? God made you beautiful. And you take that beauty and you use that very gift of God to curse God, to curse God's people, to harm and to kill. You use it against him. Brilliant people. Brilliant people. I'm not just talking about you know, people that think they're smart. I'm talking about people that really are smart. They think on a different level than we do. Brilliant people. Many, many times brilliant people use their brilliance not to honor God and exalt God and bless God, but to figure out ways to deny God and, 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 and to disapprove of God and to dismiss God and to teach others and have classrooms and students and have stadiums full of people and they teach them how to be atheists and they teach them that God doesn't exist and they teach them how to be corrupt and wicked and evil using the great brilliance that who put in their head God did it. And they take the very gift that God gave them and use it against God. Talented people do this. Man, talented people can do it. They do things we couldn't do because God just blesses them with a talent. They take that talent and they use that talent against God. The very one who gave them that talent. Powerful people do this. Rich people do this. Who gave you the ability to accumulate wealth? Who gave you the financial brain or put you in the right spot at the right time or, 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 or bless you with some big contract that, that just by, I mean, a bunch of people could have got it, but somehow you got it and, and, and it's made you rich and wealthy. And now what do you do? You use your rich to subvert the kingdom, righteousness, right, what is good. 
And, and I could name a bunch of names of Americans like this now. Just start at the top and come on down with them. And who gave them that ability to do that? And who put them in the greatest land in the world? And who gave them the opportunities? God did. And they use those very riches to, to try to kill God every time they can and his people. How much can God bless you before it becomes all about you and you begin using like David did the gift God gave you against him? It's not surprising why this happens because the very one that started this sin of pride, well, let's just, let me just read to you about him. I'm just gonna read this real quick, all right? This is Ezekiel 28. If you ever wonder where the devil comes from, here it is, Ezekiel 28. In verse 12, son of man, this is God talking, by the way. God, son of man is a, is a prophet. He's talking to Ezekiel. This is God talking to Ezekiel. And he's saying to Ezekiel, son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God. The king of Tyre was a real person, by the way. Wicked, demon, evil demon, and uh, full of the devil. And... And all people could see was the king of, Tyre, uh, king of Tyre, but when God looked at him, God saw the one who was really there, who is the devil. And he said, when you go down to the king of Tyre, who's the, really the devil, let me tell you what you tell Satan. This is what I want you to say to Satan. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes. Timbrels are like little drums, like, like tambourine kind of things. And your pipes were prepared for you on the day that you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers the one who was around the throne, that's what it means. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. In that abundance of trading means in all of the works that you were doing everywhere, in your interaction with everything going everywhere, a seed was planted in you. That's what he's talking about. And you grew it, and it became sin. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you. O covering cherub from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. I made you so beautiful, you said, I'm, I'm the most beautiful thing alive. And your beauty, you, you raised your head up and saw how beautiful you were, and your beauty corrupted you. You're, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I lay you before kings that I might gaze at you. And it goes on and on about what, you know, just, just he's hammering him. Look, the devil doesn't present himself like that. The devil doesn't present himself beautiful and wonderful and blah, 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 because he knows if he did, that we, would, that we would recognize who he is and we would reject him and say, no, devil, get away from me. So what does he do? He comes up and he whispers to us gets on our shoulder and just whispers to us and says, whoa, you need to think about this, don't you? This is wonderful. And, he, and his pride was his fall. His pride led him to rebellion, which was the original sin. And you see how God handles rebellion, right? Doesn't put up with it for a minute. <laughs> He extricated him out of there. The devil is the ultimate rebel. He had the perfect father. He lived in no, did not live in poverty. He was never abused. He, he didn't have a devil tempting him. He had no sin nature. He lived in the presence of God. He had musical instruments built into his body. He was the most beautiful, majestic angel in heaven. He was built, and myriads of angels 
led, he, was led, led, he, he led myriads of angels to worship God and his skills were unimaginable. And one day he took his eyes off of God and he looked at him himself and said, whoa, I'm something. <laughs> oh, man. I'm something, man. Yeah. yeah. And then this is what happened. Isaiah 14, couple, just a couple of verses here. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken nations. For you have said in your heart, I'll ascend into heaven. I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God. I'll sit also on the mount of the congregation on the further sides of the north. I'll ascend above the heights of the, of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, the lowest depth of the pit. Yeah, that's what, that's what pride gets you. But what I want you, you to think about is this. Lucifer, when he fell, according to the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 4. I know you'll be looking for it. He took one-third of the angels of heaven with him when he fell. Yeah, one-third. Now, this is what I want you to think about. In the presence of God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, in the presence of the majesty of heaven, in the presence of the wonderful myriads of other angels and beautiful creations of God, Lucifer rebelled against God and one-third of the other angels in heaven looked around and looked at God the Father looked at the other angels, looked at the wonders of heaven, then looked at Lucifer and said, I think I'll go with him. Now imagine the beauty of that. Imagine the persuasiveness of that. And who gave him that beauty? Who created him that way? God did. And he, so that was how he sinned. It seemed to work pretty good for him, he thinks. One third of the angels followed after him, so I'll just keep on doing that. And that's what he's been doing ever since. To Adam and Eve, God's jewel of creation. Here comes the slithery serpent of Satan in the garden and, hey Eve, come here, come here. Hey, what'd God tell you? He, did he tell you you couldn't eat out of any of these trees? Yeah, well, you don't need to listen to that, John, because he's just trying to—he's just trying to keep you from having fun. You don't have to do that. Hey, I'm gonna tell you what. What did he tell you? You would die. <laughs> he uses that all the time. He told you you were gonna die. I'm pissing. You're not gonna die. You're not gonna die. I'm gonna tell you what. If you'll eat of that tree over right over there, you will become the most beautiful, wonderful, knowledgeable. You'll become like God. The whisper of pride to destroy the lives of God's people. So the first question was what went wrong? The second question is um, how much can God give you and you not use it against him? And the third is what does your, what does your life reflect about your belief in God? And I'm just going to take this down one little alley and then I'm stopping. I promise you. I, I can see your eyes. Y'all getting tired. Let's just take your prayer life, okay? Just one little area, one little area. Let's just take your prayer life. What does your prayer life say about your belief in God? Do you pray? When you pray, you know what that means, right? When you pray, you're saying, God, I submit to you. God, I need you. God, I can't do it by myself. And God, I, you gotta help me or I'm gonna die. If you don't pray, if you... It, it, what does it say? I think I can handle it. Yeah, yeah. I'll let you know when I need you. Pride. I can do it on my own. I can make it on my own way. I don't need God. I don't need to surrender anything. I don't need all of his help in anything. And it, and it, it rejects God. It says, I don't want you. And God looks down 
at us. And God says, you know what you need? You need a shepherd. <laughs> because you're sheep and I'm a shepherd. Sheep, sheep don't know where they're going. They don't, they, 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 they have no sense of direction. Sheep have, they can't defend themselves. They are defenseless. Sheep can't bear burdens because they're too weak and they're not built right. So when God looks down at us, he knows we can't navigate. He knows we need direction and guidance. And God knows we can't protect ourselves. We think we can if we're haughty. We need a shepherd. And God knows for sure that, that we can't bear our own burdens. <laughs> My Lord, I gotta have some help. Whew, wouldn't that be terrible? So prayer says what you believe. Prayer says your, gives your humility level. Prayer gives your pride level. Just just one area of your Christian life. You can put it, apply it to any area. But there you go. That's what happened on the day of the census in Israel. <laughs> Another day in the life of a child of God. <laughs> All right, stand to your feet, would you please? Oh, no, no.